This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, actress Mercedes McCambridge presents part one of A Profile of Sarah Siddons, a reading paying tribute to the early 19th century actress. <music> Miss McCambridge. One September afternoon, in London, I lingered longer than the rest of the tourists in a particular dark corner of Westminster Abbey. I had come on private business to this chapel called St. Andrews. And so I waited until I was alone, except for a few apathetic stragglers, and then, head bowed, I approached to pay my solitary, reverential homage to the foremost example of genius in woman that England had ever produced, the yellowing, mellowing statue of Sarah Siddons is based on a great stone block, which must be almost five feet tall, because her sandaled feet that rest upon it were of a height comfortable enough for me to rub my nose among her toes. And I stepped back and looked up at Her Majesty. Imperious giantess, caryatid priestess, her figure draped in the classic style, her splendid form surpassing all grace. This was my lady. This was my actress. This was my queen. This was surely my saint. I looked down at the pamphlet I was carrying and read, this is Sarah Siddons, the most intellectual actress who ever interpreted Shakespeare. She was esteemed as a Puritan nature into which genius inspired an unparalleled gift for acting. Her contemporaries agreed that she was an actress who never had a superior, nor would she ever have an equal. Of herself, she said, I was an honest actress. And I stood before her and I prayed. I asked that she intercede for me, that some slight semblance of her wisdom her wit, her dedication, her energy, her compassion, her power and glory, and please God, since she no longer had earthly use for it, her talent be bequeathed unto me, one regrettably disenchanted American thespian. And with that, I brushed my cheek against the cold stone feet of the tragic muse and walked back to the hotel in the rain. In the long and muzzy London twilight benevolently begets bemusings. And I thought of the city in Mrs. Siddons' time in space. It was a time noted for its daring individual achievements on a truly grand scale, when Mrs. Siddons was an infant, Clive was conquering India. When she was five years old, George III began his 60-year reign. When she was 14, the steam engine was invented. When she was 21, it was the American Declaration of Independence. And during her 30s, the French Revolution began and ended with the guillotining of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. When she was 43, the Irish rebellion erupted. When she was 49, Napoleon was crowned by the Pope. 
And the following year, Lord Nelson triumphed at Trafalgar. When she was 57, there was the Battle of Waterloo. And when she was 64, Queen Victoria was born. <coughs> Mrs. Siddons lived during the births or deaths of Jane Austen, Disraeli, George Washington, William Gladstone, Goethe, Thackeray, Gibbon, Darwin, Abraham Lincoln, Sir Walter Scott, Lord Byron, and Dr. Johnson. And Mrs. Siddons took her own place in this illustrious company. My lady, my Sarah Siddons, was born in the Welsh countryside in the village of Brecon at the shoulder of Mutton Inn, a public house, on July 5th, 1755. She was the first of 12 children to be born to Roger and Sarah Kemble, managers and performers in a troupe of strolling players whose estimation was in decent regard. And Sarah grew up in this caravan life and she worked as she was needed. Her services were utilized backstage where she served as maid and prompter and scenery hand and sound effects maker. That was a job at which she felt she was masterful. She supplied with whatever was handy, the claps of thunder and the smoke from hell, the onrushing horses of the enemy, the wails of the prisoners and the call of the cuckoo. During her childhood, she performed on stage in utility roles. She memorized the entire repertoire, and she soared or suffered as the plays succeeded or failed. She slept and ate and lived and endured the strenuous life of a journeying player. And by the time that she was 16, she was irrevocably committed. It had nothing to do with ambition or resolve or choice. It was a way to make a living. And I believe that more than anything else, the genius of Mrs. Siddons was sustained by her lifelong conviction that she acted because her work was necessary to support her family. The wherewithal had to be provided. Acting was a way of delivering it. As a child, she was surrounded, along with her other little brothers and sisters, by the grown-ups in her parents' company who studied their lines and painted their faces and mended their costumes and composed their songs and invented their dances and hoped by all of this to supply the food that went on their table, wherever that table might happen to be. So that the label of actress was for Sarah Siddons inevitable and she accepted it. And she was told that she was gifted and she accepted that too. She was loyal to her company and in her own way, she felt indispensable to them, right from the very start. Actors were not well thought of in those days. There were signs posted outside many public houses and inns prohibiting the entrance of monkeys, puppies, and actors. <laughs> and when the strolling troupe of players approached a town, their arrival would be heralded by one of the gentlemen of the company pounding on a drum which little Sarah held on her proud head from the age of four, an exercise which she later credited for her glorious posture. <laughs> but the major contribution to Sarah Siddons' education and development was really something of an accident. She was thrust into her own curious finishing school because her mother didn't want her to marry an actor. Her mother had married an actor, and her mother before her had married an actor. And throughout history, women who marry actors seldom desire the same fate for their daughters. Because while actresses are vain and self-serving, the male of the species who is a performer is self-absorption and narcissism at its zenith. <laughs> So at 16, when Sarah was smitten and smote 
with one young William Siddons, ex-hairdresser turned merely adequate actor. Her parents lifted her out of the ominous situation and deposited her at a decent distance at Guy's Cliff, an elegant and affluent country estate where she was engaged as maid to Lady Mary Great Heed at a salary of 10 pounds per year. And at Guy's Cliff, Sarah was the delight of the servants' quarters and she regaled them with her recitations and improvisations. But before long, she was reading aloud from the classics to Lady Mary Great Heed in the gentlewoman's sitting room. And Sarah ate and slept sensibly for the first time in her life. And there were long walks, and there was solitude, and there was music, and there were lovely looking glasses and fragrant baths. And so important at 16, there was the sweet, sad longing for him who is loved. And as often happens, love's labor was not lost. And at 18, when Sarah was such a young lady that Lady Mary Great Heed admitted to an irresistible inclination to rise from my chair when my queenly looking dependent Sarah entered my room, Sarah left Guy's Cliff with the blessing of Lady Mary Great Heed and rushed back to the smell of the grease paint and the roar of William Siddons. <laughs> and at Trinity Church in Coventry, these two became, in the phrase of the day, involved in matrimony. And later that same year, when she was still 18, the greatest name in the annals of acting appeared for the first time on any playbill. It was in Worcester, December 13th, 1773 that an audience met for the first time an actress called Mrs. Siddons. And how did she look? What was the visage that this young Mrs. Siddons presented to her audience? Well, she wasn't very tall. She was no more than middle height. But her broad, rounded shoulders and her full bosom made her seem more substantial than she was. She reached with her figure, giving an impression of height and substance. Her profile was called grand, elegant, and striking. Her nose was decidedly Semitic and very long. Gainsborough, while painting her, said, Damn it, madam, there is no end to your nose. <laughs> her hair in most of the later portraits appears to be very dark, but evidently it had darkened from the reddish color seen in her earlier pictures. Her skin was pale, her mouth was small, but the greater part of her beauty was in her eyes. In her repose, the word most often used to express her eyes was melancholy. But on stage, her eyes were incredibly powerful. It was said that from the back of the theater, they were very powerful. And people in all walks of life said that they found in Mrs. Siddons' eyes something of themselves they thought they had held secret. So that this was the emerging Young Mrs. Siddons, the discovering actress, gaining her artistic weight, adding dimension and substance to her identity as Mrs. Siddons. As for Mr. Siddons, very early on in their marriage, he yielded the place of importance in the family to his brilliant young wife. Consequently, the information available about him is rather scant and fragmentary, but we do know that he was a fair performer and reasonably productive until he settled into his cocoon of hypochondria. He developed rheumatism and chills and catarrh and all of those cozy and convenient symptoms which elude 
precise diagnoses, but nonetheless demand restricted and undistinguished activity. He did handle the family finances, sometimes very badly, but Mrs. Siddons honored him as head of the household and felt it was his right to dispense and dispose of the family fortunes. So Sarah traveled and worked and sent the money home to William. And often she was puzzled as to why there was need for so much of it, but she nonetheless furnished the supply to meet the demand. William was usually off at some spa or other, taking the curative baths, and the children had to be educated and the residences had to be maintained, and so Sarah worked. She was a very strong woman. She once told her doctor she thought she had health to sell. But there were times when she was overworked, and at those times she drove herself with Spartan endurance. The weariness, the consuming sense of isolation of a lady actress on tour is <coughs> quite exclusive. I don't think there can be another condition quite the same. If the actress is fortunate, as Mrs. Siddons, she knows that there are nights when she's loved on both sides of the curtain, and back at her lodging, she smiles herself to sleep, content. All losses are restored and sorrows end. But the majority of her midnights are something quite else. Night after night, it's the unlovely reality of the aching muscles, the pulsating, exhausted throat, and the stinging, light-burned eyes and all the wanton emotions earlier summoned to breathe life into the play are still disturbingly warm and needful. And on this night, in this town, in this room, where one must leave a light burning because to wake up in the dark is to be lost, and in this bed, which is the property of the hotel, the lady actress has nothing that belongs to her not even herself, and this gypsy does not rest well. Mrs. Siddons was alone and troubled much of the time without the comforts of our modern day. This is a letter that she wrote to a friend, and the illness she refers to is erysipelas, a membrane infection, and the disease that finally killed her. In about a fortnight, I expect to commence my journey to Bath. Mr. Siddons is there, for he finds no relief from his rheumatism elsewhere. His accounts of himself are less favorable than those of anyone who writes to me about him. <laughs> but I hope and trust that I shall find him better than he himself thinks. I shall be here till next Saturday, and after that time at Lancaster till Tuesday the 28th. Then I shall go immediately to Bath. I wish I could remain in my own comfortable and convenient house and take care of my baby, but I think it not unlikely that my winter may be spent in Dublin, for I must go on making to secure the few comforts I've been able to attain for myself and my family. It is providential for us all that I can do so much, but I hope it is not wrong for me to say that I am tired and should be glad to be at rest indeed. I hope yet to see the day when I can be quiet. My mouth is not yet well, though somewhat less exquisitely painful. I've become a frightful object with it for some time, and I believe this complaint has robbed me of those poor remnants of beauty once admired, at least which, in your eyes, I once possessed. Yours very truly, S.S. Mrs. Siddons was accused of not having a sense of humor by many of her more foppish and less imaginative contemporaries. That's not true. She was, despite her formidable public personality, consistently and incurably shy. She thought that the aloofness she demonstrated even in small groups of people was precisely what they expected of her, and it was easier for her that way. But with her family and fellow players, she was quite funny and told her share of 
the thousand and one jokes that actors tell on themselves and elaborately. And one of her favorites was about a play, a not very noteworthy play, in which she spent most of her time on stage clutching her dying babe to her bosom. And nowadays, when you see an actress on stage with a baby, it's a, some kind of rag doll wrapped up in a blanket. But in Mrs. Siddons' day, the dolls were made of wood. So as she told it, she cooed and clutched at this baby and shifted it lovingly from one breast to the other. And as she careened around in her desolation and tragedy on stage, she misjudged her distance. And as she flung herself in despair over the iron grill, the baby, boing! <laughs> And she said there wasn't a sound for what seemed like centuries after that. <laughs> and another time, she was playing Lady Macbeth in some provincial theater, and there was no air in the house, and it was one of those just before rain, humid nights. And her costumes were heavy, and she was sticky and dizzy. And she thought before she went on in the sleepwalking scene how marvelous a cool tankard of ale would taste after the show. So she turned to one of the local handymen who was loitering backstage and told him to go to the corner pub and bring it back cool and fast. And he did. And she was just finishing the scene and on stage he came. <laughs> I wonder what he said. Here's your beer, lady. <laughs> Mrs. Siddons never failed to bristle, eloquently so, at the charge that actors were mere children, playing at make-believe, learning by rote the words which had been created and set down by another. For example, let any reader who thinks there is some one only Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, who could only speak the speech in one attitude with one set of emotions or tones, open the book and in the solitude of his chamber, try first to find out the emotions which Shakespeare meant his Hamlet to feel and then try to express those emotions in tones which would indicate them to others. If honest and clever, he will find out, after a half hour's study, how little the author has done for the actor, how much the actor is called upon to do for the author. David Garrick's widow gave Mrs. Siddons a pair of Shakespeare's gloves, and she treasured them. And in showing them off to younger actors, she said, the hands that were themselves warmed within these molds penned all that can or need be known of man and his predicament. And she said that Shakespeare was privately addressing actors in Hamlet's speech to the players. And to his words, Mrs. Siddons bore her own allegiance and admonition. She recited often the speech to the players, two actors, and very directly. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, whirlwind of passion, 
you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I would have such a fellow whipped for or doing termagent. It out Herod's Herod. Pray you, avoid it. Be not too tame, neither. But let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is, to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue, her own feature, scorn, her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Now this overdone, or come tardy off, though it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. The censure of the which one must, in your allowance, or weigh a whole theater of others. Oh, there be players that I have seen play and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak it profanely, for having neither the accent of Christians, nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man, have so strutted and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. <laughs> for there be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too, though in the meantime there be some necessary question of the play then to be considered. That's villainous and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Then you have some again that keep one suit of jests, as a man is known for his one suit of apparel. And gentlemen quote his jests down in their tables before they come to the play. And God knows the warm clown cannot make a jest unless by chance, as the blind man catcheth a hare. Masters tell him of it. Go. Make you ready. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to go make ready and get into a dress. I don't want to be a bore with Mrs. Siddons, but there is more of Mrs. Siddons and some of the things that happened to her in her remarkable life and some of the parts she played, so if you like, I'll be back. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today you heard Mercedes McCambridge in the first part of a reading entitled A Profile of Sarah Siddons. Join us next week when we present the conclusion of this reading paying tribute to the 19th century actress Sarah Siddons.
University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.